Good uh, evening, everyone. So we welcome you to this uh, second GRIFE uh, webinar session dedicated to sustainability. We hope everybody is doing well in this uh, very uh, special period of our history that we live. Uh, before jumping on the on the discussion and the presentation, I want just to inform you that this call will be recorded so that we can share, uh, let's say, this uh, uh, discussion uh, with some more customers who could have not attended uh, this call. So I am Philippe Marty. Uh, I am the head of marketing for Greif uh, Rigid Industrial Packaging, and I will animate this uh, webinar with uh, my colleague today. Uh, Aisu Katun, he, she is our Director of Sustainability and will be our main presenter. We have also Linnea Olson, uh, Product Manager Fiber, Alain Sir Jacob, Product Manager Pilgrims, Kevin Kling, Project Product Manager, sorry, Plastic, Luca Bettoni, Product Manager IDC, Chris Poole from representing FPS, and Josh Reich, representing our paper and packaging division. The objective of this webinar is really to introduce you to drive sustainability strategy and <coughs> initiatives, um, and hopefully uh, to show you the value that you can get uh, from our sustainability approach. So that will be the, the goal of this webinar. To do so, uh, basically, we will present you the main initiatives uh, and strategy of sustainability at Drive. Um, ISU will then present you on the key and main uh, market forces and trends influencing, let's say, our sustainability. We'll get then a, a, a section where we go a bit deeper on our uh, solutions uh, related to uh, products uh, for sustainability. We will conclude this to make sure that you can understand how we can help you to uh, reach your sustainability target. Once this is over, uh, we'll have a question and answer sessions. Uh, some questions have already uh, been transmitted to us, but you are more than welcome. There is a Q&A uh, section, uh, let's say on the screen that should pop up on the right side of your screen. So you are more than welcome to uh, raise any question, to write any question during this uh, discussion and we'll make sure that we answer all of them. If not, we will uh, come back to you, uh, let's say, later to answer those questions. So this being said, I'm passing, let's say, the floor to ISU for a presentation on sustainability. ISU, Thank you. yours. Thank you, Philippe. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. We have people joining us from all over the world. So thank you for participating in these um, Grife, Discovery Grife webinar series and also for your interest in the topic of sustainability, especially during these difficult times that we're globally going through. Uh, my name is Aisu Katun. I'm the Director of Sustainability at Grife. I've been at Grife for about 10 years now and I manage all of our global um, sustainability programs. So let me see if I can move my slide. Can everybody see that? Okay, perfect. Um, so first we will do a brief overview of what sustainability looks like at Grife, and we won't go into too much detail here. At Grife, our business is guided by four key principles, and one of those four key principles is being serious about sustainability. And the way we define sustainability is actually based on the original definition of sustainable development, which was uh, produced in the Brundtland Commission report. So we define sustainability as using financial, human, and natural resources wisely without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So this is what our sustainability program is guided by, and sustainability is uh, integrated into our culture. It is also integrated into our strategy. Um, what I just talked about, the Grife way, kind of forms the foundation of our business, but we have three key strategic priorities. The first one is the well-being of our colleagues and colleague engagement. The second is the prioritization of our customer success and basically creating a culture that drives customer success. And the third one is driving enhanced performance. And sustainability is a key component of how we drive enhanced performance. So sustainability 
is integrated into our culture, integrated into our strategy, but that's an ongoing process and it, it's a never ending process. And one of the ways um, that we try to operationalize sustainability within GRIF is through the governance structure that we have created. So we have teams in place that are in charge of the key focus areas that we have set for GRIF within sustainability. The global team leaders of each of these teams make up the sustainability management team who meets on a quarterly basis. They report to our sustainability steering committee, which is made up of the executive leadership team members. Um, and they report to our board of directors uh, related to sustainability. So this allows us to both operationalize sustainability, um, but also create an accountability um, system within GRIF. Our main key focus areas uh, within sustainability are delivering superior customer service, reducing our footprint, addressing risk, valuing our people, advancing circular economy, and financial performance. And you will see that within these six high-level topics, there are 17 key topics, key sustainability topics that we focus on. And these topics were actually determined by a materiality assessment that we did back in 2017. What that means is basically we looked at what the priorities are for all of our stakeholders, our external stakeholders and our internal um, stakeholders. Um, and so we held interviews uh, with some of you. Uh, we held interviews with investors, NGOs, communities, um, to determine what the highest priorities are. And based on that, we decided to focus on these 17 topics. Um, uh, we have also set um, targets within sustainability um, based on the topics that I just shared with you. Um, I'm not going to go over each of the goals that we have set because we have quite a few and our performance data, but we will make these slides available to you so you can look at those um, after this presentation in detail. But these goals and our performance data is also available on our website and in our sustainability report. And we'll share the links to those with you as well at the end of the presentation. But we do get a lot of questions about our emissions and waste targets. So I will just go over those very quickly with you. Um, Currently, our emissions target, greenhouse gas emissions target, is a 10% reduction per unit of production based on 2014 uh, baseline data, and it's a 2020 target. And I'm very happy to report that we have actually met this target. Uh, so far, we have been able to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 11%. And I need to note here that um, this is actually our third generation emissions target. So our climate program started back in 2007. Um, we've already had two sets of goals that we've achieved. So this is our third generation targets. And actually at the end of this year, in our next year's report, we will be announcing our 2030 targets. We also have a global waste target, which is to divert 90% of our operational waste from going to landfill. And that applies to every single facility that we have. And I'm very proud to report that 82 of our facilities have already reached this target, which means that they are sending less than 10% of their waste to landfill. Um, and 31 of our facilities are actually zero waste to landfill facilities. And we are very proud of this achievement. And globally, we are diverting 85% of our total waste from going to landfills through methods like recycling and reuse and composting. Um, and, and so we are, like I said, we are very proud of these achievements and we will keep on working towards that 90% target. Like I said, we have ethics and compliance goals. We have labor practices goals, we have supplier goals, we have human rights goals. So you can get more information about those on our website. Uh, we also get a lot of questions from you about our sustainability performance, our ESG performance, which stands for environmental, social, and governance. Um, so I'll just go over some of the main ones with you here. Our CDP climate change score is A minus. Uh, which puts us in the leadership category. Our CDP supplier engagement score is an A. Um, we also do Together for Sustainability facility audits. And some of you are members of Together for Sustainability. So you request um, some of our facilities to be requested uh, to be audited uh, with Together for Sustainability. So up to this point, we have had nine of our facilities audited with TFS and the average score is 94%. We also have a gold rating from Ecovadis, which puts us in the top 4% of suppliers assessed by Ecovadis. We're very proud of these um, achievements, but we really see these scores 
as a way to tell us that we're on the right path and that we are addressing the key issues that our stakeholders like you want us to, to address. So, um, before we move to the next part, can, can you really tell us about how this strong sustainability performance is relevant for our customers? Sure. Um, so, a lot of our customers are assessing their own suppliers. Um, they are using uh, platforms like Ecovadis um, and other platforms. And they want to know that the suppliers that they are working with um, share the same values as they do, uh, that they are as committed to sustainability as they are, um, and that they're managing their sustainability related risks. And so, you know, we are basically sharing this information to let you know that Bright is taking sustainability very seriously and our performance very seriously. But one other thing that I will add is these issues that we're trying to tackle, like climate change, like human rights, like circular economy, these are very big, global, important issues that no one company can on its own handle. Um, and so we are in the same value chain and we need to work collaboratively in order to tackle some of these issues. And hopefully throughout the rest of this presentation, you will clearly see how we can help you to um, you know, address some of these issues and, and reach some of these targets. Thank you, Aisu. Uh, so next, we will look at two main market forces that I'm sure you all know about. Um, these two market forces are what we're seeing really shaping our business operations, but sustainability uh, strategies. And we will also look at um, the sort of the emerging packaging trends as a result of these market forces. The first one, um, which should be no surprise, is climate change, um, what I would call climate emergency. Um, we, I think, all know about uh, this issue. Um, 2019 was the second hottest year on record since 1880. Um, you know, at the beginning of this year, we experienced the, the fires in Australia. Um, you know, we're seeing the impact on people, on their security, on our operations. So this is a really serious issue that, that, that we need to be tackling, and most of you are tackling this issue. And unfortunately, we really don't have much time. According to the experts, we, at this point in time, we have only 10 more years um, before we take, um, you know, basically before that where we need to make drastic changes to prevent global temperatures from rising above that 1.5 um, target. And most of you are aware of this, um, and this is the reason why we're seeing so many co uh, companies commit to science-based climate action. So we have about 900 companies that have already committed. We have about 200 companies that have pledged to re reach uh, net zero emissions by 2050. And some of you are among these companies, which is, which is amazing. Um, so you have set very ambitious targets for yourselves. And basically, you know, we are, this presentation is about how we can help you reach some of those targets that you have set. We're also seeing a shift in risk landscape. Um, you know, the World Economic Forum, as I'm sure most of you know, publishes a global risk report every year. And if you look at the risks that they had identified back in 2007, um, and Fast forward to 2020, you will see a huge shift in the global risk landscape. Back in 2007, most of the risks were economic risks. Whereas when you look at 2020, for the first time, all five global risks, in top five global risks in terms of likelihood are environmental risks. Top three of the top five global risks in terms of impact are environmental risks and specifically related to climate change. So this is an issue that is shaping our sustainability strategies and our business operations. The second big issue is, global, is the global waste crisis, which again, I'm sure you all know about. This is a slide that I borrowed from our partner, World Business Council for Sustainable Development, because it really summarizes the issue, I think, really well. We're seeing resource use tripling in 40 years. In the last 40 years, um, only 9% of materials are being recycled. Um, we are being told that there will be more plastics than fish in our oceans by the year 2050. And plastics has really become the poster child of this problem, which is why um, we're seeing this really having a big impact, again, on our operations and on our strategies, on our innovation efforts. And this is also the reason why we're seeing a lot of regulations coming up from all over the world. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, um, APAC, different countries in APAC have started banning um, waste imports from regions like North America and Europe. And so what this means is that, um, you know, 
countries like North, uh, regions like North America and Europe and countries all over the world now need to figure out what to do with their plastic packaging. Um, and so we are seeing a lot of regulations come up throughout the world, mostly um, addressing things like recyclability, recycling, phasing out disposable packaging. And so based on these two forces, two market forces that we've talked about, we're seeing several packaging trends emerging, both for the consumer space, but also for the industrial packaging space. Um, I won't go into detail about um, all of these because I'm sure that uh, most of you already know about some of these um, packaging trends, um, but we are be seeing trends related to using more recycled raw materials. We are seeing a demand for a more circular economy where there's no waste. Uh, we're seeing an increase in recycling and reuse and reconditioning. Um, we're also seeing an increase in, in downgaging in the demand for downgauge packaging products. We're also seeing re-commerce, which refers to reverse commerce, which is this idea actually related to some of the other um, trends, which is this idea of whether a packaging product is new or old, this idea of re-commercializing it. So for example, um, Procter & Gamble last year created a refillable um, product. So you don't actually own the product itself. It, it, and it's this idea of using the same product over and over and over again, which also relates to, again, this trend around shared economy, uh, where we don't own the product, um, where, you know, we're renting it or we're leasing it. So these are some of the packaging trends that are emerging as a result of these uh, market forces that we're seeing and having an impact on our businesses. So next we will cover um, some of the solutions and opportunities that we are able to provide to you um, to help you address some of these market forces, some of these packaging trends that we're seeing, um, and help you to reach the ambitious targets that you have set around emissions and waste specifically. So at Grife, we, uh, we are taking circular economy um, very seriously. It's part of our strategic focus. Um, and we basically have a four-pronged strategy when it comes to circular economy. The first part is raw materials. So we're focusing on the reduction of raw materials that we use. The second is production. So the, the reduction of the natural resources that we use throughout our production, which we covered in the first section of this presentation. The third component is creating and developing low carbon products and services. And the fourth component is our end of life services. And you will see that each of these provides an opportunity for you to reduce your carbon impact and your environmental footprint uh, from the packaging products that you get from Grife. First, I would like to cover um, what we call the Grife Green Tool. Um, this is basically a calculator that we have created based on life cycle analysis that we did on our products back in 2009, 2010. Um, and it basically allows a company to determine the emissions or the carbon footprint um, about the industrial packaging products that, that you're getting. So um, basically it could allow a company to determine based on the portfolio of packaging products that you're getting, what the carbon overall carbon footprint is. It can also tell you the carbon footprint of each individual product that you're getting, for example, from Grife. But you can also create different types of scenario analysis. So, if you're, let's say, getting a new steel drum, what would happen if you started getting a reconditioned steel drum? What would be the impact of that? And uh, throughout the rest of the presentation, we'll show you some of the um, types of analysis that we've already done for some of our customers uh, so that you can see how you can have an impact on your own carbon emissions by choosing more sustainable uh, options. Um, so within our rigid packaging business, we focus on two elements when we are talking about raw material reduction. The first one is using more recycled materials. So this applies to our steel drums, this applies to our plastic drums um, and our fiber drums. So we are working on increasing the recycled content um, of the raw materials that we use. The second part of uh, this, this, our strategy is to make downgaged or lighter products. And over the years, we have expanded the number of products uh, that we can downgauge. So we have downgauge steel drums, we have downgauge jerry cans, we have downgauge plastic drums, and lighter IDCs. So these allow you to basically reduce your carbon emissions because less raw materials are used. And I'll show you an example, actually two examples, of studies that we have done for our customers. The first one 
uh, is, is the customer analysis that we did where um, they were curious about what would happen if they switched from the jerry cans that they were already getting to lighter jerry cans. And you can, as you can see here, uh, we were able to analyze for them both what would be the climate change impact for them, but also how much they would be able to reduce their waste. And in this case, they were both the same 13.5% reduction for both. That's not always the case, but in this case, um, that was the uh, savings that they would be able to achieve based on making that switch. And here's another example. This is actually quite a recent um, study that we did, again, for one of our customers. And they were getting steel drums that were 10, 9, 10. And they wanted to see what would happen if they switched to an 888 steel drum or a 989 steel drum. So as you can see here, we were able to show to them that they would be able to reduce their carbon emissions anywhere from seven to nine and a half percent by getting lighter steel drums. So these are just two of the examples um, that that you know that, that we're sharing with you um, that we can do with our um, green tool types of analysis that we can do with our green tool. And now I will pass it. Uh, pass you over to my colleague Chris, who will talk about the raw material reduction projects in our flexible business. Thank you, Isu. So, uh, good good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Chris Poole. Uh, I'm the general manager for the flexibles business in the UK and Irish region. Uh, I've been working with Grife for 16 years. So, what I'd like to share with you here is are some of the numerous. So, we have a, numerous initiatives within our business. Uh, in order to re reduce raw material content in, in our products. We have a few examples here that I'd like to share with you. So uh, through um, a combination of uh, technical engineering products where we are utilizing, in some cases, higher performing materials uh, to, to enable us to reduce the amount of materials content in our product overall, uh, we are getting higher strength yields from those materials that allow that, um, that, that process to take place. We're all, we also have here a few examples of initiatives where we're reducing uh, two layer packages to single layer packages with higher performing materials where there's a, for example, the top one, you see an increase in a, a grammage per square meter of the material utilized, but that overall allows us to reduce the overall content by reducing the second layer. Uh, we also have initiatives where we are, where FIBCs have inner liners inside, so we, we can reduce the thickness of the inner liners, as I said, by utilizing higher technically performing materials. Um, and also we can reduce the, the sizing uh, in some cases of the inner liners that are used in the big bags to provide and promote material savings also. Uh, in terms of um, anti-static content, which is very important for certain sectors of industry, uh, we've enhanced our recipes to, to actually reduce the, the amount of waste that is, is generated from the products. So this is a very sustainable approach in terms of uh, a technical solution for customers. Um, we've also changed and can change the uh, support mechanisms at the top of the bag to use lighter materials, again, to reduce content. Uh, and overall, this provides, these initiatives in particular, have provided a saving of 380 tons in raw materials per year. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, hand, hand over to Kevin. Thank you, Chris, and hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Kling. I am our plastic product manager, and I'm in my 17th year at Greif. Uh, as I assume mentioned, one of the key trends we see is uh, recycled material and the concern over plastics. Uh, this has become a, a focus area for Greif, and as part of that, we developed the EcoBalance product line. Uh, within the EcoBalance, it's products that are made with uh, post-consumer resin, and we currently have a variety of products, including both tight head and open head drums that are made in mono layer, as well as coax designs. And the real difference in there is there's some trade-offs between the amount of recycled material you can use, performance, and economics. Uh, we've also got jerry cans made up to, with uh, up to 100% recycled material. And now we're focusing on our IBCs. You know, an IBC is already a fantastic package for sustainability because it's constructed in a way to be used repeatedly. And if you're not familiar with it, our pallet, as well as the feet on our hybrid pallet, uh, they're basically made from uh, used IBC bottles and drums uh, to really give it a nice circular story. Currently, uh, the IBC is not allowed to be uh, UN certified with recycled material, 
but it's something that Gripe is working on with the International Confederation of Plastic Packaging to get that change. So uh, we suspect that in the next few years you'll see IBC's recycled content become more significant as well. Now, part of the reason we're, we're really focused in this area, as ISU mentioned earlier, you know, the down gauging you saw, you know, roughly a 13.5% uh, improvement. Uh, when you look at recycled materials, we're, we're looking between 17 and 29% improvement in the material uh, reduction or, or improvement in your uh, uh, reduction in CO2. So it's really just a significant amount and will continue to expand uh, in products, particularly as the material streams become more available. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so here I'd like to just share with you um, some of the core products from the flexible packaging range. Um, we have one, one and two loop FIBCs, four loop FIBCs, container liners and reconditioning. So firstly, I should say that FIBCs uh, in, in themselves are a very sustainable product in that we have a very small amount of raw material content in products to, to, to move, package and store um, high levels, uh, high, high weights of materials. So, for example, you can typically store and fill a product with 1,000 kgs of product, utilizing a nominal value of around about 2 kgs of material. And as on the previous slide, you saw that we have a continuous drive within the business to further reduce our, our raw material contents. Um, so, um, for example, with the One Loop business, which is mainly for the fertilizer industry, you typically have an outer bag within an aligner, and you'd have around about 1.5 kgs of, of polymer uh, materials within those, those packages. Uh, four loop FIBCs are generally for a more generic container, uh, sorry, chemical products and, uh, and uh, pharmaceuticals, food products. Container liners are a very sustainable option for ISO shipping containers where you have a single. Uh, package product that, that can t contain 20 tons of, of material inside and there you'd have a typical weight of around about 20 ki kilos of, uh, of polymer. Moving on to reconditioning, so in all of our SBUs uh, we want to promote end-of-life services. We have a reconditioning plant dedicated to the uh, cleaning of multi-use FIBCs which is located in the Netherlands. This is serving generally all of the European market uh, and is a very sustainable solution in terms of uh, promoting reuse of packaging. Uh, now I'd like to hand back to Isu. Thank you, Chris. Um, and I just saw a question about um, PowerPoint, the PowerPoint presentation, the slide deck. Um, yes, it will be available to you. It will be sent to you. Um, and so we have uh, looked at uh, some of the products, sustainable products that we have within our rigid packaging business and flexible packaging business. We also offer sustainable um, uh, products within our paper packaging business. And before I go into um, the, the details, I should mention that 100% of the fiber that we use within our paper packaging business is from renewable sources. 90% of the fiber used within our paper packaging uh, business is recycled fiber. So already our paper packaging business is a very sustainable business. But within that, um, we have some products that offer more sustainability benefits. Um, some of them are the ones that you can see on the slide. Um, we produce economical alternatives to traditional sign boards, which we call lethal lamination, which is uh, the difference from, from what you find out there is that it's 100% recyclable and repulpable. Uh, we also offer paper coatings. It's an innovative wax replacement technology. And again, this product is fully recyclable, repalpable, and FDA compliant. Um, and it can be uh, from certified FSC and CFI certified um, paper. We also offer triple uh, wall boxes and sheets, uh, mainly for the agricultural um, industry and other industrial applications. And it's basically designed to protect um, shipping requirements that are very heavy, up to 1,500 pounds. And again, um, this is a fully recyclable, repalpable, biodegradable option. So we have looked at raw materials, uh, basically projects within raw materials that you can take advantage of that will help you to reduce your carbon emissions uh, by getting down-gauged um, products within each of our business units. 
we have looked at products that are low carbon products um, because whether they're using more recycled content or whether they're more recyclable, um, again, projects that you can take advantage of that will help you to reduce your carbon emissions and waste at the same time. Next, we will do the final piece, um, excuse me, of our uh, circular economy strategy, which is end of life services. Um, I should mention that within our rigid packaging business, um, all of our plastic products are 100% recyclable. So they are designed to be 100% recyclable. And all of our steel products are 100% recyclable. But that's only one piece of the end of life story because you can make products that are recyclable, but if you don't have the systems in place to collect these drums and recycle and recondition them, then you know, you're not actually making much of a difference. And so, which is why back in 2010, we created Thrive's Earth-Minded Lifecycle Services, which is a, a network of facilities that are partially and third party owned in North America and throughout Europe, um, where they collect, use uh, empty steel, plastic, or IBC containers. And if they're in good condition, they recondition them. And if they're not, they recycle them. In fact, last year in 2019, we reconditioned about 3.5, more than 3.5 million containers, and we recycled another 800,000, more than 800,000 containers. But this is one area where we need to collaborate with you um, because we can only uh, make so much difference if, if we are working together to collect as many um, products as possible and recycle and recondition as much as, much as possible so that we can uh, tackle this global waste crisis. Next, I will pass it, I'm sorry again, um, I will pass it over to, to you, Chris. Uh, actually, we have an example. <laughs> so I'll cover this example before we move on to FDS. So again, this is another um, analysis that we did for one of our customers. Uh, basically, they wanted to compare uh, new IBCs to rebottled IBCs to, um, to scenarios where, you know, they can actually reuse uh, you know, the bottle of an IBC by just getting it washed and reusing also the cage and the bottle at the same time. So as you can see here, uh, they were able to find that if they are to switch to these rebottled or, or washing options of IBCs, that they can reduce their carbon emissions impact anywhere from 60% all the way up to 75%. So reconditioning actually has the biggest impact in terms of for our carbon footprint. Um, and I should also add that um, when Kevin uh, covered our PCR product, uh, we see that we are able to reduce carbon emissions with PCR products all the way up to 50%. It depends on how much PCR is used. It depends on where in the world um, the, it's being manufactured and shipped to. But there's potential, again, there to reduce your carbon emissions all the way up to 50%. And next, I will switch it over to Chris uh, so he can talk to you in more depth about the end of life services being provided by our flexible system. Thank you, Isu. Uh, so, we have, uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, we have our Rebu reconditioning service, uh, which is located in the Netherlands. So, here we have a, a process where we start with a, engineering a product that is, is, is suitable for multi use. And as you can see with the, uh, the, the pictorials on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, this process works by first designing the big bag suitable for reuse. The big bag is then filled by our customers. It's transported to uh, our customer's customer. Uh, it's emptied, and then the bags are gathered for storage, for, for collection. We also provide as part of this service the collection cages and the logistics that help manage these services. Um, we then collect those, those used packages from our customers and our customers' emptying points. We bring them back to our reconditioning facility where we have a, a semi-automated process. So first we inspect them for suitability for reuse. Then we put them through the process, which is semi-automated. There's again a secondary inspection post uh, reconditioning, which is basically a cleaning process and a, and a process to ensure that products are fit for reuse. Those products are then packaged and then returned to our customers. And typically, you could expect uh, five or six trips from an FIBC. So the advantages of this, and to give you a summary of, uh, of our activities in 2019, we reconditioned 180,000 FIBCs through this process. 
We also uh, recycled 96,000 FIBCs that, that come to the entire end of their life cycle. Um, and, and, and in addition to this, 75% of our internal production scrap generated in our process can be used to make new bags. The benefits to our customers from this, uh, this, this service are it's a very sustainable service. It allows reuse, minimizes packaging costs. You can see the other advantages there on the, on the screen. Um, and, and what I'd like to share with you in addition to this as an as a end of life service, is we have a very exciting new project at the moment that we're working on where we are utilizing used FIBCs to recycle into FIBCs by using that used polymer uh, with a view to achieving the goals of the circular economy and that is to, to provide 30% of recycled materials into new products. So that's, a, that's something that we're working on right now and that's something that uh, we will be sharing more details on at a later stage. And with that, I'll pass back to Isu. Thank you, Chris. And this is the final piece um, of this part of the presentation. You know, we've looked at end-of-life services being provided by our rigid packaging business and our flexible business. Um, but we also provide end-of-life services within our paper packaging business. In fact, in 2019, we acquired a company called CareStar Industries. And that has really expanded our ability to recycle paper products. We now operate 20 recycling facilities in North America, and we are very proud to let you know that we are a net positive recycler. That means that we recycle more materials in volume than we manufacture, and that's that's you know that's something that we are very proud of. And the paper packaging business also offers complete outsourcing solutions for plastics and paper fiber procurement and transportation. And they also provide complete paper fiber audits and management solutions as part of this um, end of life services that they are providing um, to, to our customers. So next, um, I would like to basically summarize what we have talked about. We have looked at um, the market forces that are shaping our businesses, that are shaping our sustainability strategies. We've looked at the packaging trends and regulations and packaging trends that are emerging as a result of these market forces. Um, and we have looked at solutions that we can provide to you that will help you address some of these issues, but also help you reduce your overall environmental footprint. Um, I think it would be fair to say that a lot of us, uh, including Graif, you know, we focus on our scope one and scope two emissions, um, but with more ambitious targets that we're now committing to, um, like such as the science-based targets, such as the net zero targets, we will have to focus on scope three emissions. And that's where so working with suppliers comes in. And that's why it's so important that uh, we work together to help you to reach your sustainability targets, especially related to emissions and waste reduction. So one of the things that we can do is to actually look at the whole portfolio of products that you're getting from Greif and establish your carbon footprint, establish your total carbon footprint from those packaging products, which would form your baseline. You can then use that information to track your progress as you start implementing some of these projects where you are either switching the down gauge products or you're getting reconditioned products or PCR products. Um, and we can do many types of different analysis, scenario analysis with you using the green tool. Um, we've showed you some examples of analysis that we've already done for our customers, but the, the, let's say the range is, is a lot more than what we have showed you. Um, we can look at your logistics, we can look at your transportation, shipping from you know, products from different locations. So there are different types of analysis that we can do, uh, which will hopefully help you make informed decisions about the packaging products that you get based on um, the sustainability impact of those packages. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, the sustainability issues that we're all faced with, that our companies are committed to, uh, they are really important and big issues that we can um, address on our own. So we, there's, I think, real opportunity for us to collaborate together and you know, identif identify projects that we can all work on together to help um, you and us at the same time to, to reach our sustainability targets and, and actually reduce our environmental footprint. I think with that, Philippe, um, we can uh, start our Q&A session. 
Absolutely. Thank you. So most of the question will be for you, so you can rest a bit, uh, have a glass of water, uh, and then I will be back to you. Uh, so thank you for the people who have uh, uh, raised some question in the Q&A section. I will start with the first uh, first question, uh, and this is for you, Chris, related to your uh, Rebu program. Uh, the question is, is your Rebu program for FIBC operational in the food industry? Sorry, the question was, uh, just repeat, please. Yes. Yeah. Is the Rebu, the, the Rebu program yes. operational for the food industry? Okay, thank you. So at this point in time, it, it isn't. So it's focused uh, specifically on the, on the chemical industry um, and non-hazardous uh, dry granular products and, and powder products uh, specifically for the chemical industry. We do have plans at a later stage to, to add the service for the food industry. It is something we're thinking about and is something that we'd like to, to, to expand the service uh, onto in, in, uh, in, the, in the near future. Uh, I can't give a, a specific time frame to that. As I say, it is something on our project agenda. Um, you will appreciate, of course, for reconditioning of of products for the food industry. There are uh, obviously some hygienic aspects that are related and uh, requirements, specific requirements needed. So at this stage, the facility isn't at that level. It is uh, specifically for the chemical industry. So, but I will, at some point when, we, when we're able to share more details on this, we will communicate that later. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question will be for you, uh, Luca. In fact, there are uh, two questions which are, which are, let's say, related. Um, so to, uh, to plastic, uh, mostly. So I'm just because there are many questions arriving. I'm just trying to get it. Okay. So uh, the question is a twofold question, and then, then I will ask the next question, which is related. How can we, so Grace, can we ensure that clean recyclate for use in the food industry packaging? Okay. And also, the, the, the next question is uh, about the impact of the recycled content on the performance criteria for the UN performance testing. Um, let's say, and the other question, which is also related, has GRIF already approved packaging with PCR recycled content for plastic drum jerry can for the food industry? Luca? Okay, thank you, Philip. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Luca Bettoni. I'm the ABC product manager, and I'm based in Italy working for Grice since 18 years now. Um, well, the regulatory to the, I will start from the performances because uh, this is where we have uh, uh, the longer experience here. Uh, everything is made by the selection of the raw material that uh, we are collecting or the packaging that we are collecting. Thanks to a, a great selection, we can have then products which are performing uh, basically as a new product. But it's important to have the right selection uh, up front. And this is what we are doing, and this is part of our process. So before to start anything, we, are, we want to be sure that the selection is uh, the key element uh, where to start. The selection is an important point also for the food industry, that's for sure. Today, we, we didn't enter yet uh, in uh, the food industry with uh, recycled polyethylene uh, product because most of our packaging uh, is uh, collected by uh, the chemical industry. Now we are entering and starting a, a program where to uh, collect uh, uh, raw material or empty packaging also from the food industry and see if we can have uh, a separation from this packaging from the other chemicals in order then to have uh, this raw material used properly in our end product. Because uh, the polyethylene uh, is uh, suffering about migration, so even if you have a multi-layer technology and you produce it externally, uh, on the ex external layer, the risk of permeation and potentially uh, contamination still exists. That's why we need to ensure that uh, everything that we are introducing in our production process will be only coming from uh, food if we want to dedicate the final product to food. Okay, thank you, Luca. Thank you for the, uh, the answer. Um, another question that uh, uh, is for you, uh, Haisu, that came at the beginning of the, the session where you were presenting on the, the slide on our performance on energy, waste, and water. Um, the question is, I see a lot of number in your slides. 
can you explain us a real project or real project uh, which Gripe has realized regarding those topics? Um, so this is referring to the emissions and the, the golf flight. Okay. Um, we are actually working on, as I'm sure all of these companies here are working on many different projects to make sure that we are reducing both our emissions, energy, and our waste. Uh, so when we look at the energy space, a lot of the projects that we work on are energy efficiency projects, and that changes from region to region, facility to facility. A lot of them are equipment upgrades or you know, switching from normal lighting to LED lighting. Um, so there are a lot of energy efficiency projects that we work on. For example, in 2019, I believe we completed 84 projects globally um, that was related to energy efficiency, which you know, also helps us cut down our costs, but at the same time, helps us reduce our energy and therefore emissions. Um, globally, uh, we source about 12% of our energy from renewable sources, and that's something that we are working on to, to improve and to increase. Our goal is to uh, be able to source at least 25% of our um, energy from renewable sources. So we have some facilities where we have uh, solar panels that we have directly um, invested in, but then we also have some purchase power agreements or PPA projects um, in China uh, where we don't own the solar panels, but um, we are taking advantage of the emissions reductions. So we're working on, in terms of energy and emissions, a lot of different types of projects. Um, when it comes to waste reduction, um, our you know, target, which is uh, quite an ambitious target, which is to divert 90% of waste from going to landfill, uh, we have a global team in place. Um, and what we did is actually we created waste matrices um, for matrices um, for each one of our facilities. And basically, we did a list of all of the waste streams that go out from each one of our facilities. And we looked at how each of those waste streams are being treated, um, whether they are incinerated, whether they are sent to landfill, whether they are recycled or reused. And so that really gave us visibility into the different waste streams that we have and how we are currently um, dealing with those waste streams. And we use that to basically create roadmaps um, to, to determine the next steps that we need to take. And we also use those waste matrices to basically share best practices between facilities. What we find is that one facility, you know, two facilities have the same type of waste. One is actually able to not send it to landfill because they've figured out a system, whereas another facility has not. Um, and so we use that as a way to share best practices too. In terms of actual projects, we have so many. Um, so what I would say is that on our website, um, we have a section called highlights. So it's, it's called a tab called Goals, Performance, and Highlights. And if you check the, click the Highlights tab, you will see uh, basically a lot of stories, I think about 45 stories, and some of those are related to strictly waste reduction. Um, you know, it, it can be anything from, for example, um, uh, one of our customers actually told us in Sweden that the films that we wrap around our jerry cans were very tight and hard to remove. So as part of that project, we realized that we actually found an alternative that reduced the waste from that film that goes around the uh, jerry cans by 46%. So that's just one example of the types of projects um, you know, that, that, that we work on, but we have many more. So I would um, highly encourage you to check our highlights um, stories tab on our website. Okay, thank you very much, Aisu. Another question for you. Uh, and there are many questions, so I'm trying to, uh, to do my best to. Uh... <laughs> To read them all. Um, the question is how GRIFE is interacting with governments to influence them to move to the innovation, the regulation, and speed up the changes? Perhaps the question you can also enlarge on in which organization are we members and participating, and yeah, how do we interact with uh, organizations and governments? Sure. Um, so we don't actually directly interact with governments, and that's based on an internal um, GRIFE policy. But what we are doing is we're working actively. We're a member of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and we're also members of their both Factor 10 group, which is a group that's basically fully focused on circular economy initiatives. And we're also a member of their Energy Solutions group, uh, which is a, a group basically as you can imagine, uh, which focuses on climate uh, strategies. And so through 
WBCSD, we work to, to have an influence on, on governments. Um, we help WBCSD uh, with providing um, information um, and they, base, they put together reports that are presented to different members of governments in different regions. So that's how we interact with governments to, to, to make an influence, but we don't directly interact with governments ourselves. Okay. Thank you, Aisu. Um, another question which I think I will address to you because it's also about, uh, relates to the green tool and, and perhaps you can tell us more a bit about the green tool. So the question is, if we need to buy brand new drums, in this case, 45 gallons, which ones are the most sustainable, plastic or metal? Um, I think it's also perhaps an opportunity that you tell us exactly what are all the products which are covered in the green tool, uh, the green tool calculation, and give also a bit more of, let's say, what are the, 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 the information and the criteria that we are measuring in the green tool? Sure. Um, so let's start with um, which products are covered with the green tool. So green, right now, all of our risk packaging products are can be assessed with the green tool so any product within the rigid packaging um, family business unit can be assessed by the green tool any product within the flexible business can be assessed by the green tool um, the only business unit where we don't uh, currently offer green tool services is our paper packaging business that's something that we hope to add in the future years um, but other than that all of our products can be assessed by the green tool um, the, and Second, I guess that was the last question, which is uh, what are some of the criteria that are being considered by the green tool? And we really look at nine different factors. Um, and one of those is climate change, carbon footprint, which is what our customers are usually concerned with. Um, but we also look at, for example, um, freshwater use. Um, we look at acidification. We look at um, ozone layer depletion. So, so there are nine um, sort of factors that we look at. So for example, if you're a company and you have water reduction targets and you want to work with your suppliers to make sure that um, you know, the packaging products that you're getting use as little water as possible, that's also a type of analysis that we could run for you um, to let you know, first of all, you know, how much water is being used for the packaging product that you're currently getting and also, if you wanted to compare that product with other products, what that would look like and how much you know, of a water reduction you would be able to achieve. Um, and going back to your first question, which is which products are more sustainable? So that's a very difficult question to answer because there is no easy answer. Um, so to give you a quick answer, what I would say is if we take a steel drum, a plastic drum, and a fiber drum, and if we assume that all of, all of them get recycled at the end of their life, the most carbon intensive product will be steel followed by plastic followed by fiber. This is talking about our rigid packaging business. Having said that, um, this in no way uh, should tell you that fiber is more you know, sustainable than steel or plastic is more sustainable than steel because uh, we need to consider a lot of different factors. So for example, if the plastic drum is getting incinerated at the end of its life, then actually that it can actually be more carbon intensive than steel. So we actually, when we do these types of analysis, we need to consider what type of steel drum are we talking about? Is it a recycled steel drum? Is it a reconditioned steel drum? Is it a downgate steel drum? Which would then have an impact on our ability to recondition it. How many more trips is it going to make? The same thing applies to a plastic drum. The same thing applies to a fiber drum. So we need to consider what type of drums we're talking about and we're comparing. We need to take into consideration the product that gets transported in these products, uh, in these packaging products. We need to look into where they are being shipped from, where they're being shipped to. So there are a lot of different factors and there is no easy answer is, is what I would say. But that's why we do the analysis. Yeah, that's why we have the green tool to help you uh, assessing these for your particular cases. Um, I see also again for you. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, two questions which are related to the trade-off between sustainability and, and profitability. So, one one of the questions specifically is uh, uh, let's move here is uh, from the, your 
procurement step, sorry, may I ask how you make the trade-off between financial matter and reduce CO2 emission, for example, if there is a new material that can help reduce CO2 emission by one ton per year, uh, there is 5% additional cost. So can you perhaps describe more the process of our purchasing process uh, related to this? Sure. And again, there is no um, there is no single answer to that. So we basically, um, when we do a project, and just like you were saying, let's say we have a project where you know we can source is a material that's more sustainable, but it's more expensive. We basically look at it case by case and how important it is um, for our overall sustainability program and the targets that we're trying to achieve and how much of a difference it's going to make. So for example, to give you an example, um, in the past, we have um, made agreements to do uh, renewable energy certificates um, and uh, source energy from utility companies or um, re basically source uh, renewable energy from utility companies where the cost was higher. But because you know we have targets that we are very determined to meet in those cases, even though it was more expensive, we actually did implement those projects. Um, whereas in other cases, and again, I'll give you an example, uh, we were approached by a company that makes uh, plastic from ocean plastic. Um, and you know we did a lot of studies with them, but at the end of the day, um, even though it was going to be a more sustainable raw material, we had to go with, um, we had to basically decide that, you no, know, we can't source it from, from this one company because it was more expensive. So it just really depends on the project, on how much it's going to make a difference um, especially on the targets that we're trying to achieve. Thank you, Aisu. Uh, so uh, I just would like to make some, some final comments. Uh, so we cannot answer all the questions, but you can be sure that the question which have not been addressed uh, yet, uh, we will get in touch with you, make sure that you get those answers. Either we're gonna call you or we're gonna uh, contact you via, uh, via email. There are some uh, few questions. So what I would like to, to say uh, also uh, before concluding is that for any additional question that you have, you can of course contact your usual commercial uh, uh, person or uh, we have put here in the presentation, uh, let's say the contact details of HiSU and feel free to contact her directly uh, for any specific question that you would like to discuss with her. On top of this, and there, there was a question of if uh, if we would do a, a webinar on diversity, uh, let's say part of this, uh, uh, let's say our uh, development in this uh, very special period is that we are developing a set of webinar. Uh, you will get some invitation to the next uh, webinars, which will be around uh, products, innovation, but also solutions. But we are also more than happy uh, to uh, propose all the webinars based on your request. So do not hesitate also to, uh, to reach out to us uh, if you have some interest in, uh, in topics you would like Graf to, uh, to, to provide you information. Um, so back to sustainability, you have also uh, our page on our website on sustainability, which is very much detailed and you can find a lot of information. Uh, and we have also recently uh, issued our 2019 sustainability report that you can also find on our uh, on our website. So this uh, being said, uh, I want to thank you all for your participation. Thank you for your questions. We definitely remain available to answer any of your other questions or, or concerns. And so I wish you a good day, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Thank you very much. Bye bye.